So I now want to start talking about molecular orbitals in reactions. Um, and uh, the reality is there's actually quite a lot of information that we can go into over here. Um, so I want to cut to the chase and I want to just um, deal with some of the terms that we use um, and get them out of the way as quickly as possible. And then I'll go into a little bit more detail um, with regards to how we use molecular orbitals in reactions and understanding. All this has to do um, with the fact that reactions, um, which is what we're interested in in chemistry, um, are driven by orbitals. Uh, they're driven by the way that orbitals over interact with each other and the way that they um, form new bonds. Um, that is at the heart of, uh, of chemistry. And, and essentially, when bonds form and break in, 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 in reactions, they are driven by two factors. Um, obviously, the um, the one is what I've just said is the um, orbitals, uh, and the second um, thing that they're driven by is is charge. Now, now charge we can get out of out of the um, out of the way fairly quickly. Charge is your pluses and minuses. When you've got a plus uh, positive charge, uh, it's going to attract a negative charge, and I think that kind of thinking is uh, pretty much entrenched in, 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 in the way that you, you've dealt with chemistry so far. So that, that's no problem. And this is, this is an important factor. And we will always um, be looking at charge when we uh, do reactions. It's something we must uh, always consider. Um, but it's the orbital aspects which haven't yet been discussed uh, in your course. And this is what we're going to start dealing with over here. With regards to orbitals, um, there are two main orbitals that are important. And so we started to look at these molecular orbital diagrams, and it turns out that the most important orbitals that we look at are the frontier molecular orbitals. They're the ones right at the, the highest energy uh, of, the, uh, of the molecular orbitals that have been put together. Uh, by highest energy, we're actually talking about um, the one is the HOMO, which is the highest occupied molecular orbital, and the other one that is important is the LUMO, which is the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. The reason these two are important, um, and we'll come back to when we do examples, looking at the shape and that sort of thing, is that the, the HOMO is effectively, it's because it's the highest occupied molecular orbital, in other words, it's the orbital that has electrons in it, um, it's the orbital that's going to donate electrons to something. Uh, and in organic chemistry, when something is donating electrons, we talk about that being the nucleophile. The highest occupied molecular orbital is actually, in organic chemistry, is what we typically talk about as being the nucleophile. And the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital, that's the one that accepts electrons, uh, and that is therefore the electrophile. Okay, so now we've connected uh, two terms that we've seen before, nucleophile and electrophile, and we've connected them to an orbital description. It's the highest occupied molecular orbital for the nucleophile, the lowest unoccupied uh, uh, molecular orbital for the electrophile. What is important here is when reaction, which is driven mostly by orbitals and not charge, um, for a good reaction to occur, we like to have these two as close in energy as possible, all right? Um, and so we can now qualify what makes a good nucleophile and makes a good electrophile in a reaction in terms of their partners. They actually need to have the home of the nucleophile and the loom of the electrophile need to be as close in energy as possible. If we think about it more carefully, uh, what this actually means is that the highest occupied molecular orbit, remember, was actually lower in energy than the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital, generally speaking. Uh, and so what we want is for a good nucleophile, we actually want this highest occupied molecular orbital to, to be as high in energy as possible. And we want the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital to be as low in energy as possible. So um, good nucleophiles have equal to high energy homos and good electrophiles are equivalent to having low energy lumos. 
All right. So that's one of the most important things that we need to uh, take home. This is the uh, the basis. The next thing that's uh, important to recognize um, for now in this uh, thing, I just want to quickly talk about some typical examples of good nucleophiles, which are, are high, uh, the highest occupied molecular orbitals. And a good example of these is almost always are what we have been calling so far lone pair electrons. Okay, lone pairs are the really, really good examples of nucleophiles. And we'll look at some molecular orbital diagrams to see um, why that comes about. Um, the next example of a, a good highest occupied molecular orbital in reactions is uh, a, a pi bond. Um, and we'll see some examples of, uh, of that. And the last example that I want to talk about is a uh, high energy sigma bond. Okay, a high energy sigma bond. And we're going to see examples of that uh, as we move through the, the course. For now, I just want to focus a little bit on the lone pairs just to explain why it is that we have uh, these are good uh, nucleophiles and why they are high energy uh, uh, or highest occupied molecular orbital that has high energy. So what I have in front of me is uh, an example of a molecular orbital diagram for something as simple as ammonia, that's NH3. Now, this already is, for something simple, it's a very complicated molecular orbital diagram. Um, the next example we'll do is actually going to be a simplified one, so I don't want to go into too much detail with this, but other than to, to see that uh, um, uh, ammonia, NH3, has is N with three hydrogens, so three sigma bonds, and there's also a lone pair. Um, and the lone pair is always a orbital that has actually not undergone any kind of interaction. It comes from the nitrogen right at the beginning. And so what we see in a molecular orbital diagram is that the highest energy occupied molecular orbital, which is this one over here, has not changed in any energy. It's basically remain the same uh, because it hasn't interacted with any of the hydrogen uh, atoms in the first place. And so lone pairs almost always end up being the highest occupied molecular orbital. And they, they find a, for, over here. Now you see that these molecular orbitals are all at different energies and that might be a little bit confusing. To go into details of how we actually generate a structure like this is well beyond the scope of this course. So we're not going to, uh, to do that. But the important thing here is to recognize, so this would, of course, would be the LUMO in, uh, uh, in ammonia. That's the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. But this one over here is the highest occupied. And that is the, it's a, it's a non-bonding orbital because it's just lone pairs. And so it sometimes just has an N on it uh, to indicate that. These over here are our sigma bonds to the hydrogen. And these ones over here must be the anti-bonding uh, orbitals, sigma star and sigma star. All right. Okay. So, um, so this is the uh, for ammonia. Uh, what I want to show you though is an example of uh, formaldehyde. Now, this is actually a simplified example um, of the energy levels for all the molecular orbitals for formaldehyde. You'll see it's, um, it, technically speaking, I've drawn some that are sitting here now on the same energy level, uh, uh, showing that the same energy. That's not true. Uh, they all are actually at slightly different energies, but they are pretty close to each other. Um, but this just simplifies things just to make it a little bit uh, easy for us to actually understand how we're going to fill this, this diagram out. So it's not in, in, entirely wrong. So uh, when we look at this, we've got uh, carbon, hydrogen, carbon, hydrogen, carbon, oxygen bonds, and there's a carbon, oxygen, pi bond. So how do we actually fill all this up? Well, the first thing that might be easy to do to fill up with the electrons is just to put in how many electrons do we have? We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and then there's two sets of lone pairs, so 9, 10, 11, 12. So we can put in all our electrons if you were to guess, from what I just said to you beforehand, where are the lone pairs of electrons? I think you'd be happy to, to guess, and you'd be right, to say that these two over here represent the lone pair of electrons. These are effectively, when we combine with oxygen, they are sitting at, the, they were unchanged, um, and so the energies are uh, will be the highest. Remember, whenever we combine two 
atomic orbitals, they drop down in energy. So something that doesn't combine with something, uh, with another atomic orbital, is going to be unchanged. And therefore, if you think about it, it's going to be one of the, high, the highest uh, orbitals. So that's why lone pair electrons are always highest occupied molecular orbitals. So these are the lone pairs. So we can put them in and say N. So what about these over here? Well, um, we've got one, two, three sigma bonds and one pi bond. Um, pi bonds are higher in energy. Um, so this one over here is likely to be the pi bond between carbon and oxygen. So these three over here must be the sigma bonds. And if we think about it, uh, the way I've drawn it over here will make it a little bit easier, I guess. Um, those two are the same. That one's different. So this must be the ones that are carbon-hydrogen sigma bonds. And this one over here must be the carbon-oxygen sigma bond. But we can also rationalize the, these levels. It's not too important. I'll just mention it very briefly. Um, remember that uh, uh, the 1s orbital of hydrogen is actually relatively high in energy. Uh, and so when it overlaps with the carbon, it's much higher than this, which is a much more electronegative atom. Its orbital, when it overlaps with carbon, is going to bring everything down a lot further. And of course, these over here are all our antibonding orbitals, and they mirror things. So this is the pi. This one must be the pi star antibonding. This is the sigma antibonding and the sigma antibonding of that would be sigma for carbon hydrogen, and this would be sigma antibonding for carbon oxygen. This is the pi antibonding orbital. We look at this diagram, all right, and we say to ourselves, um, so what is the, the highest occupied molecular orbital? It is this one, these ones over here, all right, which is the lone pair. So the, the highest occupied molecular orbital is the lone pair. What is the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital? LUMO, it's the pi star antibonding orbital. Now, when we do reactions of carbonyls, which is coming up uh, sh uh, shortly uh, in, in, in this lecture series, uh, we'll start seeing reactions with this LUMO. But what I want to do here very briefly is just to show you the concept, why this is important, why it's important to realize that the lone pairs are is the HOMO, and that is why we're going to start doing reactions with it. And I'm going to show you with a very, very simple example. It is... Um, something that happens all the time when we work with carbonyl compounds. Um, so I'm going to take formaldehyde, and it's the reaction with an acid. It's H+. And what we've always shown you with the mechanisms is we take the lone pair of electrons, and we add it to the H+, like that. It's an equilibrium. It's an acid-base reaction. So we protonate uh, the oxygen. It ends up like that. All right. So that's the mechanism for the addition of uh, protonation of an oxygen. So we get that. Uh, this, of course, um, oxonium, which has been protonated, uh, does have a resonance uh, intermediate. We could actually draw it like that. So the pi bond breaks, goes onto the oxygen, and so we end up with a plus on the carbon. So it would look like that. All right. So that's just the resonance intermediate of that. Now, um, the question is, is why these two are the same thing, but why is it that we took the lone pair of electrons and added to the H? Why did we not do the reaction this way? Why didn't we show it um, going to H plus? Why did we not take the pi bond and add it to the H plus? Because that would give us... this over there, um, which is exactly the same as that over there. So if we use the pi bond, and we would have got, and this is then the same as that. So why didn't we do that? Well, the reason we didn't do that is that the pi bond is not the nucleophile. The pi bond is not the nucleophile because it's not the HOMO. It's not the highest occupied molecular orbital in this reaction. Uh, and so um, lone pair electrons are way better, and we won't do this mechanism is actually incorrect, whereas this one over here using the lone pair of electrons is correct. Molecular orbitals uh, is 
a very, very interesting uh, section to look at. Um, and you can go into a, a lot of depth with this. We'll be doing some examples in class and we'll be moving forward. Um, what I want you to know is that at this level, the second year, we're looking at it, we're treating it very, very simplistically, really, truly. This is a really simplistic way of, of looking at things. And the key thing here that I'm wanting you to uh, take home with, this is an interpretation aspect, but the key thing I'm wanting you to take home is what I said right in the beginning, is that um, reactions are orbital driven. You need to know that the highest occupied molecular orbital equates to the nucleophile, and a high energy HOMO makes a good nucleophile. LUMO is an electrophile, is the electrophilic part of the molecule that's uh, where the reaction takes place, and low energy LUMOs make things uh, are, are good electrophiles. So whatever lowers the energy of a LUMO, going to make it into a better electrophile. Whatever raises the energy of a HOMO is going to make it into a good nucleophile. And those are the things that we need to uh, uh, connect when we're thinking about molecular orbitals in organic chemistry.